Hey everybody, and welcome to episode 22 of Death Space Filling the Void. My name is Patrick Jones. Oof, what a weekend we had here in Charleston, South Carolina. Still working on that southern accent. <laughs> we went to see a live show. I, Jamie and I went to see the last podcast on the left at the, I think you say Gallard Center? Gaylord Center? Beautiful theater. A lot of fun to see a live show. I, I'm a big fan of Last Podcast on the Left. If you're unfamiliar, they do true crime, cryptids, you know, alien encounters. It's it's very funny, and they do a good job telling the stories. So I definitely recommend checking them out or going to see a live show or or whatever. But yeah, it just felt good to be in a theater. I mean, it's still nerve wracking to be around people, and, and so that took a little bit of time to like settle in and be like all right there's gonna be people around me and that's okay everyone had to be masked up that that certainly helped and they were checking to make sure that everyone had a, a vaccine or, or if they're unvaccinated taking a rapid test so that always helps as well and then on saturday we went did a bunch of stuff and then went to a restaurant called five church down here in charleston my goodness ladies and gentlemen Swordfish confit, <laughs> the roasted squash, oysters, even the fingerling potatoes were would make you want to write a letter. But yeah, in, enjoying fall here in Charleston, it's very different than living in the north where I've lived my whole life. Because there's a progression, right? So you wake up, it's about 40, 45 degrees. Mid-morning, 55 to 65 Midday, as high as like 80, 85 sometimes. Mostly 75 midday, but but it does get up to 80, 85. And then, of course, cycles back down. So if you're going somewhere for a while, you, you have to not only dress for the moment, but the fact that it's going to be, the weather's going to be drastically different in 30 minutes. I mean, throughout the sentence, the, the weather is different. But yeah, it's, it's, it's really nice and, and beautiful here. Charleston's the best. And really exciting that uh, Jamie and I are heading to Minnesota for Thanksgiving. So won't have to worry about choosing outfits for now and later because it's just going to be cold. <laughs> the Twin Cities are fantastic. Really excited to get up there for Thanksgiving. And we'll be driving. So we're going to be checking out about 35 states or however many are between South Carolina and Minnesota. Well, we've got a great interview today. I spoke with medical anthropologist Dr. Erica Borgstrom, and we talked about how, well, we talked about what medical anthropology is, how it's used, and, and how it can and change things. So Dr. Borgstrom studies death and dying across cultures. So she's gone to Africa, she studies in England, and that information can be used in many ways from developing different policies to hospitals helping people figure out their wishes or or how doctors communicate with patients it's all very interesting stuff that i think you're really going to enjoy and, and really learn a lot from so before we get to that interview i just want to remind you that if you're liking the show to please remember to rate and review it and check the show out on facebook instagram twitter and youtube all right let's make our way to dr erica borgstrom as always, thank you so much for listening, and enjoy. Joining me on the podcast, I have senior lecturer at Open University, Dr. Erica Borgstrom. Erica, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me today. I mean, I, I'm so excited because we're going to talk about your profession, which I knew nothing about before coming across your account on Twitter, and that is medical anthropology. Yeah, so I, I'm, I call myself a medical anthropologist and my job at the Open University is as a medical anthropologist who research is end of life care. Yeah. Um, so I originally trained as an anthropologist. For those unfamiliar with anthropology, anthropologists broadly understood on look to, to research people and cultures across time and space. And within the discipline of anthropology, there's sort of sub-disciplines, biological anthropology, so understanding human bodies, human evolution, other primates, cultural anthropology, understanding different cultures. There's also archaeology and linguistics, depending on how you define anthropology. And then there's medical anthropology, which is what I've specialized in where we're really trying to understand how health, well-being, illness, and in my case, end-of-life care and death, 
are shaped by social and cultural factors and how that might differ in across different places or and like be comparative and, and if there's anything sort of universal in all of that. My goodness, I feel like we could do, I mean, this is a podcast about death and dying and you're studying cultures and, and how end of life care is, is affected by culture. So I feel like we could do 40 episodes because you know there's a lot of people and, and if you go back to the past so i i mean my heart rate just jumped up i just got so excited because i i feel like there's so much that we can talk about so getting started into the field wh what made you want to specialize in the medical aspect of, of anthropology or, or maybe just how you got into anthropology yeah so okay well i'll start with how i got into anthropology which is a little bit of a funny story so as a lot of teenagers are i didn't know what i wanted to study i was sort of going oh, i want to go to university because i don't know if i want a job yet kind of thing sure. and at the time my parents had subscribed me to these like teenager magazines that would come in the post uh, younger listeners now will think what would you get a magazine in the post that's a strange thing but anyway in those magazines <laughs> at the time it had um sort of like quizzes about what you could do for the future and it just so happened one quiz that i did came up with anthropology which I thought was quite a forward thinking answer for, yeah. a quiz, uh, for a 16 year old to come across. And I, I didn't really know what it was at the time. So I spent a little time looking into it and I thought it was quite cool. It struck me at the time as a teenager, as a subject that would perhaps open up my eyes and give me job opportunities that would allow me to travel. So I was really intrigued by Good that. Good thinking, yeah. Yeah, um, and at the time I was an expat or an immigrant living in a different country. So I quite, quite liked that idea of, I already had some experience of living in a culture different to my own, but being able to do that as a profession sounded quite cool. So I went off uh, to university in the UK, which was in a third country for me to study anthropology. Um, and I specifically chose a university that exposed me to the different disciplines of anthropology so I could have that sort of variety and then have some time to think about what kind of anthropology I really wanted to do before I specialized further. And I just really enjoyed the, the medical anthropology lectures and seminars that I had. I had never really thought up until that point about actually how different people's experiences of an illness could be across different places because disease always seems so singular in how it was talked about you know there's a, you know heart disease is heart disease regardless of where you're at and actually medical anthropologists show you that that's not the case even within a, one country there are many different experiences of heart disease based on people's ethnic background, socioeconomic status, religious beliefs, all of those things. So for me, I just thought that was really fascinating. Also at the time, again, trying probably perhaps being a little bit strategic about future career of going, well, there's probably careers in medical anthropology because governments are often looking at how they can improve their policy and improvement and, and their healthcare systems and, and thinking about socio-economic inequalities in health really interests me. But I also had a long-standing interest in how people made sense of death and dying as a way of then making sense of how they make sense of life. Like how do they value life based on how they talk about death and dying? So when I came to do my master's, I actually did some research on infanticide in parts of Northern Ghana, and they were linked to different beliefs around spirits and it, whether or not these children were bad spirits or perhaps coming to harm local community. But there was also some other types of literature discussing that these infanticides may have come from more of like an evolutionary perspective around being able to uh, sustain life in societies where uh, economic and food resources might be quite precarious. And if there's certain individuals born with health conditions that might be more difficult to uh, survive in those conditions, what they're like. So there's different dynamics at play when doing that research on infanticide that just kind of blew my mind actually this this concept of death actually has many different explanations to figure out and so yeah so it really kind of drove me into that area of exploring it further i did make a decision strategically though that i didn't want to do a phd on infanticide um, at the time i was a young woman looking to have children myself and i didn't really want to be pregnant doing field work on a topic that dealt with the issues of of young children dying so i ended up looking at the other end of the life scale and looking at end of life care later in life that's beautiful. You know, it's so funny hearing you like take a quiz that like ended up with your career. I feel like I ended up taking those and maybe it's just like the difference of like growing up in the US. The results I kept getting were like rancher, marine, army. It was just like, get a gun, you're in the US, go do something like that. But that's beautiful yeah. that uh, you found your calling. 
Well, I really hope that, you know, that there's someone, some editor at that magazine knew that they could do something for someone's future by throwing in something more a bit left field, perhaps. But um, mm -hmm. I will say any of the career tests that I did at school said I should have become a banker or an accountant. Um, the only thing travel related was flight attendant. I was quite good at mathematics at school. And so I think I kept was trying school was trying to drive me that way much to a lot of people a lot of my colleagues are shocked when they hear that you know I was good at maths and I really enjoyed maths because a lot of my research is qualitative based so I deal a lot with text rather than numbers at the moment oh okay um, but you could you could jump into but I could yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> potentially yeah but I right. really like people's stories and I really like as an anthropologist one of our key methods is called participant observation and within that we often do a much broader notion of ethnography and for me as a, that as a method means I get to hang out with people and just kind of see how they live their lives and I really enjoy that um, that sounds amazing I mean I have a podcast because that's what I like doing right like you're I like meeting people and talking to people that sounds so wonderful before we get into that I just had a, a question about medical anthropology when I hear anthropology I think uh, a study going backwards in time. Do you study disease and end of life care for, let's say, the plague or, or going back further, or are you more focused on today? So some people will do things that are a bit more historical, mm -hmm. um, and some people will do things that are a bit more cross-cultural. So they'll look at how death and dying or end-of-life care is done in different cultures. I've been quite interested in contemporary medical anthropology, so, so where anthropologists are trying to understand how things are happening now. Like, what is the logic behind how healthcare is set up, for example, and how does that work? And when I say logic, it doesn't necessarily mean the, the rational reasons that it happens, but sort of the patterning that happens to, to make sense of something. So to give you an example, there's an American medical anthropologist called Sharon Kaufman, and she's based in the US, and she's done a lot of research in the US uh, around end of life care and around hospital usage. And she's written several books that outline how, for example, treatments in the, U the U.S. have evolved over time and that what in the U.S. has become a standard of treatment has escalated over time. So, for example, being able to implant a defibrillator near someone's heart to keep their heart beating. At one point, that would have been quite a new and novel technique and would have been reserved for very few people, uh, if at all. And over time, because of things like insurance policies, the way things get billed, the way things um, technology advances, what would have been a very novel treatment has now become actually a very standard treatment. Hmm. And she poses the question, at what point when we have these things that it increase the standards and it kind of escalates technologically what's available is how do we know when to draw that line? And how do we know that individually? How do we know that as a society when there's these different factors at play that determine what becomes a standard treatment? And, and she shows that actually there can be tension in knowing when to, to draw that line. So then she uses that sort of ethnographic research where she spends a lot of time in hospitals, a lot of time speaking to patients and their families, where there's those tensions between wanting to live, wanting to pursue more treatment, but not wanting to suffer, or not necessarily wanting to prolong life because they've lived the life they wanted to have, but then the technology enables their body to keep on going. And with the defibrillators, there's quite an important question to ask that because to enable someone to have a quote unquote natural death, you actually need to deactivate the defibrillator because otherwise it will just keep oh shocking the heart. That sounds awful. Um, Right. Well, it could be right for yeah. some people that would be and for others it went but her I would really recommend her book. So one is uh, I was going to say beyond the line or so I can't remember the names now, but she has two really good books mm -hmm. that really bring to life her, her research in, in that field and actually like say show the, the cultural logic that has allowed certain things to happen because they don't have to have happened that way. They're not inevitable. There's just certain systems that have set them up to now be standard. Yeah, so it seems like one of the tools of your industry is is getting into a, a culture and speaking to people how how does that then translate into research right i feel like human beings we have you may have really connected with one family and and really be thinking about them when you're trying to come up with like general trends how do you translate communicating with people into broader suggestions yeah, and that's a really good question, particularly for anthropologists, because it can be hard to, to sometimes make it clear what that, that link is from sort of really in-depth research from one person to something that might be more transferable or generalizable. Mm -hmm. So one of the ways we do that is talk to multiple people so that we're you know not necessarily always just focusing on one case example, so that we test our ideas 
in multiple scenarios to, to make sure it still holds true in that sense. There's a lot of work that we also do around our theorizing. So is, is what we're saying and what we're, we're doing making sense to the grander theories about how we understand how people experience health and illness or healthcare works. One of the ways I've done it in my own research when I've looked at end of life care in England is I've spent a lot of in-depth time with say a select number of people have spent time in their homes, followed them on, on the hospital visits if they happen to go to the hospital and they allow, you know, give me consent to come with them and the doctor's consent that I can be there and speak to their family. And then I'll also spend time with healthcare professionals and try to see it from their point of view as well. So shadow them in the wards, shadow them on their home visits to people's homes, again, with people's consent to be present. And then I write up all these notes. So I, I make notes while I'm there, sort of shorthand notes. And then I go back home, type up long, long, long notes. And then I start to go through it and code it, going, what kind of patterns am I seeing? Also, where has something happened that's not helping elsewhere? And how can I make sense of that anomaly? And then I bring those different elements together to try to tell a broader story about what end of life care might look like or, or where there are certain tensions in end of life care. So I've spent a lot of time looking at tensions around notions of choice and advanced care planning and sort of future planning here in England. You mentioned, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, you've, you've done work outside of England. W what is it like, you know, people may be m uh, mistrusting of, of someone from another country coming, especially in cases where the culture is vastly different from uh, a Western culture, right? How do you how do you get people to feel comfortable and, and open up? I mean, because medical things can be so heavy, right? And they may not want to share. Yeah, they, that's such a good point. And it's not just medical things can be so heavy. There's so much about people's lives that they might not want to share with a stranger and let alone someone who they view as very different from themselves. So when we train as anthropologists, there's a, a word that comes up a lot in our training, which is rapport and building rapport with people. So there's different techniques for that. And some of them are actually really cultural based. So you kind of have to understand the cultural etiquette of the place you're going to, to help build that rapport. Uh, you don't really want to make social faux pas because that won't necessarily help your case. One thing I've, I've done a lot is tell people a little bit about what do, being an anthropologist is and mm -hmm. and part of that in, is that I'm trying to understand something from their point of view and so I might ask questions that seem really stupid but that's because I don't want to presume that I know something and actually that can kind of lower people's guards a bit and uh, of that, that they don't necessarily see me so much as an expert because I'm not positioning myself as an expert in that, that scenario. They are the expert about their lives and they can then tell me. And that's something I've done, you know, when I've done research in Ghana as well as, as here in the UK is sort of that, that um, repositioning of the power of balance from there. It's also really important to tell people sort of what's going to happen with the information that they, they tell me, particularly if there's mistrusts around medical systems or if there's any concern that there might be legal ramifications about what they, they tell me. So things about how data is going to be stored, who's going to know it, if I even record their name, that kind of thing. So that sort of helps build trust. And sometimes actually it just takes a lot of time to get people to open up. And so sometimes it might be visiting them again and again over a period of time. A lot of anthropologists would historically and traditionally and even now do field work for, for a long length of period of time. When I say that, it could be like 12 months being in a place to sort of gather that information, to really build those relationships with people and, and actually to see how life is in their, in, you know, in their sort of full calendar year, because we know mm -hmm. Also, seasons can affect how things happen and that kind of thing. Um, but it does take time. And it's also important to remember that not everyone's going to want to tell you stuff. So I think for me as an anthropologist, remembering actually I'm not always going to be able to get to the information, Donna. And, and I remember actually when I was in Ghana trying to ask some questions, there were, there were definitely interviews that I've done where people won't tell me that something was happening or they would tell me other people did it, but not they, they did do it. Mm, and, and it was a, a bit less. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so just like going, okay. And just making him not going, okay. And, and trying to go and be reflexive about my work going, okay, what can I do to maybe improve that rapport or why might they be telling it to me that way? And just making those notes in my, in my field record as well. So I, I sort of have a, a transparent record for myself about what's been going on and, and how that might influence the data I'm collecting. Yeah. That sounds great. So is the is the goal of, so you, ha you have your notes, you're looking for broader trends, is the goal to then pitch that to a government to, to put in policy? What happens with when you've identified these trends? Where does it go from there? 
Yeah, that's a really good question. So I think it depends a little bit on what the anthropologist wants to get out of it and, and kind of what this, the study's been set up to do. So sometimes the studies are much more theoretically oriented and they might not have mm. sort of practical so what implications, but they might just be like, well, actually, maybe we need to rethink a little bit how we presume these things happen, right? So a lot of anthropologists take things that might be taken for granted and flip them on their head when they've really studied them in depth and go like, oh, actually, this is this is how people are experiencing things. In my work, it's been a mixture of doing that. And I often say I hold up a mirror to sort of policymakers and healthcare professionals to sort of reflect to them what they're doing or how they're saying things and the impact that they're having but not necessarily tell them how to do it differently. Because again, I'm not presuming that I'm an expert in knowing their jobs, but I can tell them like, oh, this is perhaps the unintended consequence of you taking this policy initiative. And, and this is how it's playing out in people's lives. For example, when I've researched advanced care planning here in the UK, at the time I was doing some field work, they, they had this document called the Preferred Priorities of Care document, and they wanted people to fill it in to sort of say, you know, what type of care they wanted and where they wanted to be cared for and where they wanted to die. And policymakers thought it was really great because pe people should have choice about those things. Like that sure. was the rhetoric, right? People should have choice. And, and that kind of choice individual rhetoric was is not necessarily apparent everywhere in the UK, but is becoming bigger in healthcare settings. Um, healthcare professionals quite liked the idea of this document because if they knew where someone wanted to be cared and died, it could help them manage the system. They could organize different equipment to be sent, for example, in someone's harm and that kind of thing. So they liked the idea of these documents being filled in. But when I spoke to people and when I watched what they did with the documents, not, not many of them were filling them in. Like they, they, they just would let them sit. I mean, I spent four hours one day with a woman trying to find where she put the document in her home office only to find it not <laughs> filled in. And you know, then I started talking to people like, why aren't you filling it in? And there's things about, you know, how the questions were phrased, but it was also things like, well, the document was glossy and it made it really hard to write in pencil, which then made it harder to change because if they wrote it in pen, it felt too permanent. So even things like that. So then going back to the healthcare professionals and going, oh, you know, you could give non-glossy versions and it might be Or like an internet based. Yeah, or there's different ways. Um, <laughs> or going back to the, you know, the government going, oh, people aren't thinking about their lives in these great ways. You might want to do it slightly differently, but not necessarily telling them, oh, this is going to change it this way. This is going to work because I don't have that kind of information, but I can at least show them, oh, this is the real way, the real life ways. And it's usually a multiple of ways that things are happening. And you might want to reflect those in your policy and practice yeah. in addition to the ideal ways that you're, you're envisioning. That makes so much sense. Just policies have the best intentions and, and not that anyone's doing anything wrong, but like the real life implication may not be apparent until they have research like that to peruse, I guess. Yeah. And, and it is hard because policy is often a combination between vision and practicalities, right? Mm -hmm. it, and they're having to, to, to bear in mind how to operationalize things. And they're, and they're trying something out often when they're writing policies. It doesn't necessarily they mean they know what's gonna work best going forward. They're trying something out, but it's useful to be able to go and go, oh, but this is what has happened now that you've tried this out. Right. Um, <laughs> it's gonna put a little tweak to it, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, well, let's talk about your research. Feel free to talk about something that you're proud of working on in the past or, or what you're working on now, whatever excites you. Yeah, okay. So I've done a, a few things. So I've probably been doing research on palliative and end of life care for over a decade now uh, mm -hmm. here in the UK from starting from just before my PhD when I looked at how medical students reflected on meeting patients who are receiving palliative care. And that was really fascinating. So I read essays that medical students in Cambridge had written about what it was like to meet patients. And, and what really struck me in, in what they were writing, in, and I've written two papers on it, is one, there, they had internal conflicts about how they should respond to patients who were dying and expressing grief, and particularly anticipatory grief around their death, and how much emotion they should dis display and if, how professional they had to be. And, mm -hmm. um, and there was this tension around, you know, being needing to be this authority figure and needing to be someone who was relatable. So we wrote that up because that's quite an interesting thing for us to think about in terms of how we're training future doctors to relate to death and dying yeah. and, and acknowledging actually that already they're identifying it's going to be hard for them because they don't know how to act in that mm -hmm. space. So actually that's a space for us to maybe intervene and encourage certain skill development and certain ways of, of viewing empathy and that kind of thing. The other thing I found really interesting in reading their accounts was 
they often presumed if a patient wasn't doing something like writing an advanced care plan document, that they were in denial about their, their death, their impending death, and that it was the doctor's job to get them past that denial. So they had a very, uh, a very um, you know, a Kubler-esque model of how dying should go. Mm-hmm. and that people had to be pushed past that denial stage. Now, reading that as an anthropologist, I wasn't sure those patients were necessarily in denial, and I say that with air quotes as I speak, but, but it was interesting how the, the medics in training were already positioning patients not behaving according to what they were expecting as somehow them being in some sort of other psychological state rather than seeing that there might be other reasons that they're not doing an advanced care plan. For example, they don't like to... Yeah, they're depressed or they don't like to fill it in or actually they they would rather someone else make those decisions. And those are all legitimate reasons for not doing an advanced care plan. It it doesn't mean they're in denial about dying. So I thought that was just a really, again, an an interesting way of going, "Mm, if this is how medics in training are thinking about palliative care, what can we do to perhaps change their training Mm -hmm. to sort of position it as a way of understanding a wider range of human responses to, to death and dying? That's very interesting. Do you happen to have the other side of that where people who are dying, what they would want? I mean, because it is definitely a cross section of, of, oh, go ahead. I I don't want to. Yeah, there is a cross. So, And that's some of my other work. When I have then spent a lot of time with people who were were supposed to be in their last year of life. And like, this is where I've done a lot for my PhD. I literally hung out with these people who were supposed to be in their last year of life to kind of see what is it like to be in your last year of life. And from there, there's a, it's again, quite a variety of things that people want. Some of them really want doctors who are upfront and tell them straight, like, this is your prognosis. This is how it's going to go. These, this is how you can plan for it. Other of them are just kind of really sick of all the medical appointments by the time they get that far Mm -hmm. and are waiting for, for someone to say, actually, we can let up on some of this. You don't necessarily need to go for these extra rounds of treatment. Some are in a position where they don't want to necessarily have to make decisions about their own lives. Uh, Particularly I had, I've had some people that I've spent a lot of time with who, and this is not a, you know, an overgeneralization, I don't want to make an essay, but perhaps maybe older than some of my other participants and have just said, well, we've made lots of decisions in our lives. Uh, making this decision isn't so important for us, but it might be important, say, for our children. Sure. And so maybe they should be the ones to make that decision. So that might have been around what level of care they had or if you know they were due to have some more intensive treatment. So it's interesting that there's a lot of variety. And I think what's hard sometimes when you're doing sort of medical education is to get across that variety mm-hmm. and to sort of give doctors, nurses, healthcare assistants, chaplains, the skills to connect with that person to understand what it is they want. And when I work with healthcare professionals who do palliative care, because they have a lot more experience in doing that, spending that time communicating with someone, trying to understand where they're at in their own life journey and their disease trajectory, they have some of those skills, but even then they find it sometimes really hard to know what a patient wants and how to care for them best. And it can be tricky because sometimes people don't know themselves what's best for them and what they really want, right? It's new and scary and there's a lot of emotion behind. There's a lot of emotion, a lot of emotion, and there's a lot of unknowns for a lot of people and that can be difficult to know how to respond to. So I I wish, I I often ask, can you give us some like 10 clear tips? I wish I could come up with those 10 clear tips. Maybe by the end of career, I might have those. Mm -hmm. But the the top one is just recognizing that there's variety out there and really making sure that we're equipping the people in our care systems to respect and manage that variety. Yeah, you got to be a little bit on your toes and being able to like, someone may, like you were describing, someone may want to chat about it all the way till the sun comes up versus someone who may just be like really closed off. And so a rule of 10 tips might apply to one and not the other. Yeah. And um, I mean, that's one thing that I really followed up in my further work on advanced care planning is, is seeing where some of those tensions come. So here in England, in 2008, there was a national end of life care strategy that sort of made end of life care national policy within our health and social care system. Since then, there have been sort of different iterations. Um, But within that, the notion that individual choice around death and dying, not including assisted dying, though, should be around. So people should have choice about treatment and place of care and death. Those are like the top Mm -hmm. types areas of choice. And it was a, a way of 
including more patient-centered or individualized type care. And that's quite an important move that was happening politically at the time within the UK because our National Health Service is, is state-funded and there's always a tension around how much things are standardized in state-funded care versus really personalized and individualized. So there's that move towards that. And a lot of the healthcare professionals, as they're saying, liked the idea of, of giving patients this choice around what, what kind of treatment do they want, what kind of care do they want, where do they want to be cared for. But when I followed them around, it was striking to notice how infrequent they had those those conversations directly oh, or wow. you know and, and then you know query with them oh well it's really difficult to find the time it's a very sensitive subject we need it's you know maybe it's not appropriate to do it in the hospital ward i mean our, our hospitals tend to be ward based so there's maybe 12 people in a room so you can only pull, pull a blue curtain um, and they're very aware that you know a curtain's not going to stop the other patients in the ward hearing the conversation mm -hmm. and so that, that would be even people who were really wedded to the idea that patients should be making these decisions and documenting their plans found it difficult to give the space for those those conversations and then on the flip side i had the people who weren't even willing to fill in the forms when they were sat in their home it doesn't mean those conversations are important it's just we might have to think about different ways of, of structuring them doing them and also maybe not always thinking of them as such big conversations mm -hmm. that are inherently going to be sensitive and difficult because if we set them out as such it might make it harder to have them. And what really brought that home to me was I was doing research with one man who was living in a care home and the care home, and he had given me permission to look at all his care home records. And in the care home records, it consistently said he didn't want to talk about death and dying, which I thought was ironic because the whole purpose of having me come and visit was explicitly to talk about end of life and death and dying. <laughs> and so according to the care home, he was not willing to talk about that. And yeah, I would spend hours each week talking to him about these issues. And so then it was like, well, he might not want to talk about it with you. It doesn't mean he doesn't want to talk about it. And with me, the conversations interwoven along with a conversation about his past, uh, drinking mm. a cup of tea together, rather than me sitting down going, so, where do you want to die? So I think there's just different ways of doing yeah, those things. That's a great point. You, you have a very inviting presence as opposed to someone just like sliding a form across a desk being like, Phil, we need you to fill this out now. It, it's, yeah, yeah. It, it's much more inviting when there's someone, you're chatting about your life and, and reliving things. I'm sure that's extremely emotional and but also feels good. And I think it, for me, if it felt like it was probably more validating for him to, mm -hmm. to think about that actually, it did matter what he thought perhaps it because it was tied up with other ways of understanding who he was and who he is rather than just being oh here's a decision for when you die we need to know where you want to be um, right. it's, it's quite a different way of framing it but i understand pro care professionals are very time pressured so it mm -hmm. it can be harder to allow themselves to have the time to to have these conversations that are woven in amongst other things right they can't just have like a 90 minute chat over some tea all the time when they got to care for x amount of patients unfortunately <laughs> yeah it's a lot harder for them to do that yeah. yes <laughs> If you're listening to this podcast, one of the reasons may be because you're interested in having your death or a, or a loved one's death be celebrated in, in a different way, to, to think outside the box a little bit. I, I personally really like the idea of that. And that's why I'm partnering with a company called Spirit Vessel, who creates these guided personalized ceremonies for yourself or, or a loved one. Well, just to give you a little bit of background, Spirit Vessel is a sister-owned company that is bringing sacred ceremonies around death back into the home in a beautiful and meaningful way. I love it. I love the idea of, of making it more personal. And I've experienced wakes and funerals that it felt so cold and, and wish that I could inject a little bit more personality and, and more storytelling to help the grieving process. Spirit Vessel has these handcrafted ceramic urns and personalized celebration of life ceremony packages that can be done in the comfort of your home or through webcasting services. Whether you're grieving the loss of a loved one, preparing for an imminent death, or taking steps to plan for your own death, Spirit Vessel provides resources to help you respond from your heart with creativity and courage. So basically you can design your own creative and, and personalized intimate ceremony 
that represents the person who you're celebrating. And there's also tips to help people who are grieving going forward. So whether you're interested in the celebration of life ceremony packages, or you'd like to check out or order one of their handcrafted ceramic urns, which are so cool, by the way, check out Spirit Vessel. And if you do order anything, feel free to use the promo code DEATHSPACE for free shipping. If you're like me, it can be really hard to come up with the words to say in a card. I know, I always laugh too, because talk about 10 years of improv training down the drain. <laughs> Not being able to come up with anything. But especially, that's especially, but that's especially, but that's especially so. I don't know why I can say especially. There you go. Perfect. I can say it. <laughs> During times of grief or when someone loses someone. But thankfully, there's the card studio. There are no words to comfort in a time of deep loss, but you send a card because you care. Yeah, because as we've learned through this podcast, sending something, saying anything is better than saying nothing. The card studio creates your message, writes it in your card and mails it for you. See, they'll help you out. You have the intention. The card has the words. Bing, bang, boom. All you do is pick the card and tell why you're sending it. No anxiety, all care. For a message from your heart, but not your hands. Just sit back and enjoy your relationships. You know, you won't have that awkward feeling like, ah, was that too much? Did I say too much? Am I talking too much? As I'm literally talking too much? As opposed to figuratively talking too much, Pat. All right. (laughs) My inner voice is kind of mean to me. The Cardistudio.com, thoughtful, just got easy. And better yet, you can use the promo code DEATHPOD, one word, for 10% off all orders. Do you ever lie in your resume? Huh? Look at me. Look at me when you're lying. No, you should never do that. That's a terrible idea. <laughs> but it can be daunting to, to look at a, a job listing, see everything that you have and, and things that you probably don't have. But we can fix that with my software tutor. My Software Tutor offers three levels of real-time Zoom-based courses with a live instructor. So I'm going to keep you on task. They've seen it. They've heard it. They've seen the resumes. They know the holes. But they're here to help. They all deliver practical, functional business skills in a friendly and supportive environment. It'd be funny if it really wasn't a supportive environment. Like, when are you going to understand this? <laughs> of course, that's not the case. That's just the anxiety or... or or reliving fear dreams we had as children. These courses will increase your marketability. The job market couldn't be better right now. So it's a perfect time to invest in yourself and and improve that resume. Whether you're an employee, job seeker, consultant, or contractor, you can sign up for these classes at mysoftwaretutor.com and use the promo code POD20 to save 20% off all registrations. Would you look at that? All right, enjoy that new job. So you also have this publication, Mortality? Uh, yeah. So, I'd love to hear about that. Yeah. Yeah, I can tell you that. So I'm one of two editors of the academic journal Mortality. It's officially published by Taylor and Francis here, here in the UK. Interestingly enough, both myself and the other editor, Arner Arneson, it are both anthropologists, but that's a fluke. It's not always edited by anthropologists. <laughs> um, the, the journal's been around for just over 25 years now, and it was originally founded as a way of giving space for the interdisciplinary field of death studies. So recognizing that actually there were scholars in anthropology, sociology, humanities, history, ethics, uh, you know, palliative care, all writing about death, but actually that if you brought them together, they might learn something really interesting from each other. And that giving them that sort of academic space to share their things can allow really useful cross fertilizations. And so it's, it's been going really strong. And I say that academic journals sometimes shut after, you know, not going so well. And actually mortality has increased the amount of publications it can release each year recently. So we have a lot more people submitting to us. So clearly it's a way of booming field or death studies is, is an area of interest for, for researchers. What we seek to do is, is give space for those interdisciplinary discussions. So sometimes articles that we publish will come from one say academic discipline, but have findings that might resonate for others. And sometimes it's really like a group of authors who work across different disciplines who have done some research together that are then trying to share that. As editors, Arna and I are very 
conscious of supporting early, people new to their career as well as those really well established. So we have well established professors that publish in our journal, but also we actively support new authors. So whether they're new to academia or say just finishing their PhD or they're new to publishing in English about death studies. So we spend a lot of time sort of helping them refine their argument and shaping their papers for that. That's incredible. That's such a, a good way of collecting all the stories, right? Because if we're just looking at the top universities and, and their findings, you'll always get the same thinking. Yeah, you will. And and I think for us, it's really important too, is that there there is something in that interdisciplinary space of learning from each other. It's not all psychology versions of how to do things. and But it is interesting also to see, you know, like our journal, like journal metrics, they, like, I'm not necessarily a huge fan of them because they can be quite biased in, in terms of how we measure things, but the journal metrics rate very really highly for things like theology and religion. So mm. people in, in those disciplines come to mortality and read and cite the papers in there because they find it really useful, even though they might not be citing just the theology ones. They might be citing an anthropologist who's done a study in a different culture, but it's useful for them to reflect in their, their studies. So that for us is quite interesting to enable that space because that doesn't always happen in academia sometimes just like in other parts of life we kind of have our silos mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it's used to kind of break break that down and i'm very aware that mortality isn't an open access journal and that's partly due to sort of how the publishers have set it up we do have some papers that are open access and freely accessible all, to everyone all the time but we also have a feature where we have interviews with death death study scholars that are open access and those are open access on a rotating basis so for every month or two months there's a particular interview that's free to access oh, um, and those yeah and those interviews are really great for people who are perhaps less interested in reading academic papers and all of the jargon that comes with reading an academic paper because mm -hmm. it's an interview and it's much more discursive and, and, and sometimes a little bit more insightful in terms of people's careers and trajectories and why they've done things. So so we've made those open access because they're a little bit more accessible. Exactly and, and like the gentleman that you were describing having a cup of tea. It's yeah. like breaking down these thought or, or heady studies into just a chat. Which is yeah. Nice. <laughs> well, is there is there something I know people don't have full access to the the trade journal, but is there or trade journal uh, um, scientific journal? Is there something that has struck you some some research or, or a particular article that made you go wow? Yeah. Oh, we, oh, that's really hard because I have to then remember what's been accepted for publication or yeah. What can oh, I talk okay. about that's already been out? Yeah. Um, <laughs> It's okay. You don't, you don't have I to. will say there's one that's coming up for, it's scheduled to be published in 2022. And it's a special issue that we commissioned as editors on pandemics. So we commissioned this really early on in the, in the start of uh, the COVID pandemic. But what we specified in our commission is that we just didn't want it to be about COVID-19 because we knew death scholars had been studying death and dying for a long, long time. And actually we had a lot to learn from previous epidemics and pandemics and bringing those into conversations with what's been happening with COVID could be quite interesting. So I'm quite excited about that, that coming out. So that will be next year. Um, the other thing I've, I'm quite excited about is we've had said, some of those interviews with, with scholars. And for me, I find those quite interesting too, as someone as an academic is to see how other people's careers have gone and what sort of influenced their careers. And it's always interesting to read, you know, when people's life experiences have influenced it. And you don't always necessarily hear about that in an academia. And sometimes that's that, that reveals a gem. And it just, it, it just, for me, at least, it just reminds me that life is, is incredibly varied, but also that our work lives and our personal lives aren't always so starkly separated as we like to pretend at times. And that sort of enmeshing of life and what makes life meaningful for these death scholars is fascinating for me because I'm always interested about how things are, are meaningful in life for people um, I love through that. the lens of death. I feel the same way. <laughs> yeah. It's very interesting to me. How has your research taught it? it, it segues perfectly into, you know, you research end of life care across cultures. How has that research affected your life? Yeah, good question. So I will say at times it's been very frustrating. Mm. So 
there, there were times, so I have very vivid memories of actually when I just started researching the palliative and end of life care stuff in the UK and the things with medical students, and I had been doing a lot of readings around rituals about death and dying. My maternal grandmother died and I flew back to the States for her funeral. Mm -hmm. And I remember sitting in the church going, why can't I just pay attention to the service as her granddaughter rather than be the anthropologist going, oh, the priest has done this or oh, so-and-so has done this. I was so attuned to paying attention to details for the purpose of noting them and observing them and making sense of them that I, I felt that was getting in the way of me necessarily feeling it as a granddaughter. Oh, okay. So that's been a bit frustrating at times because it feels like it's at conflict, like there's two different yeah. sides of me. At other times I reflect on that and I go, well, actually that's, that's part of my own meaning making. I pay attention to those details as a way of making sense of what's happening around me. And I probably did that even before my anthropological training and it's just why I found it as a nice fit as a job. So there's, mm -hmm. there's fits and rounds about. The other way my research has affected me is when I was doing my PhD, just as I was sort of finishing up my my field work, my paternal grandmother be, became really ill and it turned out that she had cancer and she was choosing, and I say choosing again, quite lightly there, not to have further treatment. Actually, she asked her cardiologist to say that further treatment would not be good for her heart. And therefore she could tell the oncologist that she wasn't having further treatment. So she was very oh, strategic in how she did that. I love um, that. Yeah, <laughs> that she was this very genteel woman and just was like too polite to say no to a doctor. So therefore she needed the other doctor to yeah. say it. And she supposedly loved the idea that I might come and study her, but I felt like I couldn't study her. But I did take some time off to care for her and spend a lot of time, kind of like I did with my research participants, just hanging out in her house. I drove her to see her friends and, and drink milkshakes and eat pie, because that was pretty much all she wanted at the time. And it felt at times really difficult to take that time off of my research, my study, my career to, to spend that time with her, particularly because it was an unknown time. But also my research has showed me that it was really important to do that for me and that she would value it as well, hopefully. And so it, my research at times has helped me reevaluate certain life decisions mm -hmm. where I think for me personally, I often would push for the next career move or be quite ambitious and want to, you know, commit a lot to my work. Whereas actually it's been like, no, it's, it's worthwhile to take some time off and, and not necessarily work and not overwork. And, and that can be really hard in academia where people joke that it's like a, a 60 hour a week minimum job. And actually I've, I've tried not to do that at all because there's so much more in life. Yeah, so it's taught me to do that that way. Smell the roses. And smell the roses, do stuff. Well, yeah, have downtime. Spend mm -hmm. the time with people that, that matter to you. Um, and as someone who lives far away from some, some of my family members, that can be particularly important because it takes more of an effort to make that time for people. It's not like I can just nip down and, and, and go have dinner with them. Like, you know, right. I, need to, I need to physically take time off work for that. And I think the other way it's really... Uh, change some of the ways I live is, and it maybe changed the, the way other people around me live is they know I'm not afraid to talk about death and dying. So I am the, I am the friend, you know, if someone has something come up that they will drop the message and say, can we talk or can you listen? And at times that can be really difficult, but at other times I think it's quite a privilege to be the one that just kind of holds space for people. And again, for me, I'm willing to make that space for friends because of the things I've seen through my research. Well, that's incredible. I mean, you're, I, I think you're right. That is an absolute privilege, but as long as you're taking care of yourself and because at times if you're, you don't have gas in the tank, that could be really painful. Yeah. But I think that's the other thing, I guess that the research helps me know is, is when I don't have those times. Mm -hmm. Right. So, it, you know, I, I have to, as part of an um, anthropology research, we have to be quite reflexive in our work and we write diaries a lot of times. So I can have a sense of, Oh, maybe that's too close to home. And, and I do, pay attention to like what kind of research topics I study to, to make sure I'm not overlapping with things that might be really upsetting for me in that sense. Mm -hmm. And then again, if friends come with things that I go, Oh, maybe actually that's, that's not great for me to talk about, or I don't have any resources mentally, emotionally time to deal with it, to be able to, to point them to the directions where they might need to get that, but also to let them know it might be a, not now, but not, and not never. Yeah. So it might be a conversation I can't have right now, but it doesn't mean I won't ever have that conversation with you. That's great. That's incredible level of communication skills. <laughs> like, that, that, that's very impressive. Well, is there, is there, I, I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Is there anything, I mean, I, I was going to ask if there's anything I'm missing, I, I, I'm missing oceans worth of, of stuff here, but 
before doing another episode, is there anything I'm missing right now about your work, mortality? Uh, um, oh, I guess the other thing I, I if I, as a way, like as a way of a plug, maybe we'll put it that way, is right. um, some of the work I've done at the Open University. We have a platform called Open Learn, which is our free educational platform. So about 25% of the education we produce as a university is offered for free. And on Open Learn, I have quite a few either articles or videos that people can watch. But the one that I quite like that's come out of my ethnographic research and really where I've used the information about what people are confused about, where the tensions come about in terms of care planning and decision making are featured in, in what's called life or death decisions. And it's an interactive. And what we've done is we used research and created a film, a dramatized film, where someone has, is found on the floor unwell and the ambulance is called. And we use that film. And what we do is we take you through part of the story, then we pause it, and then we ask the viewer what you would do in that situation. And then we give you a bit of information about what might happen. And then you keep going. And I really recommend that people do it. And at the end, there's an optional survey for people to fill in additional information about advanced care planning. And if they've thought about it themselves, or if the film has prompted them to think about their own future. But really, I'm, I'm quite proud of that film. It's, it's won a few awards, and it's quite a nice uh, way as an academic to see my work come to life in something other than an academic article or book. Yeah, that's incredible. And and just being like a foot in the doorway for people to have conversations that may be very important for them or to them. Yeah, or also to realize if they're not that important to them to then know that, right? So that if yeah. those conversations do come up, they can say, oh, I have thought about it. And not for me, thanks. <laughs> That's a great point. Yeah, right. The opposite side of the coin is absolutely true. Yeah. They're all valid responses. I think that's the important thing is humans are incredibly varied and, and in their varied form, they are all valid and that not thinking that people should do a particular thing. I love that. That's, that's a great message. Well, Dr. Borgstrom, thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed this. Do you want to mention your social media handles? Sure. Um, people can follow me on Twitter at Erica Borkstrom. So that's E-R-I-C-A-B-O-R-G-S-T-R-O-M. Great. Thanks again for your time. Thank you. Studying across different cultures has got to be so difficult because people just are very hesitant to talk to outsiders, especially when it comes to death or dying. I mean, we don't want to talk to our friends and family about that stuff. And of course it is hard, but hopefully trying to make it a little easier. Well, thank you so much to Dr. Erica Borgstrom for an insightful, thought-provoking interview. And I just want to give the heads up with next week being Thanksgiving, I'm going to take the week off. So there won't be a new episode of Death Space Filling the Void next week. You know, between this podcast, my other podcast, that gives me anxiety. Please check that out. That'd be great if you could check that one out as well. And having a full-time job, it's just a lot to juggle. So I want to just take a week and and not worry and breathe and just enjoy the holiday so the next episode will be december 2nd oh my gosh i can't believe it's going to be december i hope you're able to take some time off and breathe during the week of thanksgiving i mean work usually slows down a bit right like for the most part people slow down a little bit and i hope you're able to take advantage of that take note of of what you're of what you're thankful for and and just be with friends and family and if you're outside of the u.s you know, you could still do those things, but it'll just be Thursday <laughs> and not Thanksgiving, not a holiday. And once again, I'd like to mention and thank the sponsors, Spirit Vessel, use the promo code DEATHSPACE, one word, for free shipping on personalized urns and the celebration of life ceremony packages. The Cardist Studio, you can use the promo code DEATHPOD, one word, for 10% off all orders. And my software tutor, you can use the promo code POD20 for 20% off all orders. Well, as always, thank you so, so much for listening. Have a great two weeks. Have a great Thanksgiving. And I'll talk to you December 2nd. Bye.